And now, we come to Dynasty VI, the last dynasty of the era in Egyptian history that we call the Old Kingdom. Like with previous dynasties, number six was linked to the one that preceded it. Recall that Dynasty V's last king, Unas, failed to secure for himself a male heir, and so the husband of one of his daughters was chosen to succeed him. He became known as Teti. Since Teti was Unas's son-in-law and not a direct descendant of the king, the chroniclers of ancient Egypt most likely decided to start a new dynasty with his reign. Now, I know I've said this a lot, and forgive me for being repetitive, but like with most things with regard to early antiquity, there's a lot that we don't know, and often the information that we have contradicts itself. For example, it's still not totally agreed upon how many kings were members of the 6th dynasty, let alone how long they cumulatively reigned. Minito states that the kings of the 6th dynasty ruled for 203 years, but the Turin canon, which was probably compiled towards the end of the New Kingdom period, states that it lasted for 108 years, and even adds a few kings to the list. In this program, we'll go with what the consensus of Egyptologists currently believes. Most likely starting his reign around 2345 BC, Teti's transition to the throne seems to have been relatively smooth once his succession was secured, and the policies of his government were essentially a continuation of those started by his predecessors. In fact, many of the same people were retained, such as two former viziers, Mehu and Kejemni, both who had served the previous kings, Jejkari Esesi and Teti's father, Unis. Another, Isi, the overseer of the province of Edfu, was also a holdover from Unis's reign. All three of these individuals were held in very high esteem, and texts from the period indicate that they had the adoration of the gods for their service to the crown. Perhaps the most powerful official during the reign of Teti was Mereruka, who was also his son-in-law through his daughter, Sheshesset. He eventually became Teti's vizier, which made him one of the most powerful men in Egypt at the time. He was also extremely wealthy, as can be seen by the ruins of his elaborate 33-room mastaba, where the bodies of him and his entire family were eventually laid to rest. The elaborately decorated walls of the mastaba's interior are one of the Sixth Dynasty's greatest archaeological treasures because of their beautiful, painted reliefs depicting life in ancient Egypt. Scenes of farming, fishing, feasting, and wildlife can be seen on many of the Mastaba's interior walls. Teti was laid to rest in a relatively small pyramid at the edge of Saqqara. Just north of Teti's pyramid are the ruins of two smaller pyramids belonging to his wives Iput and Kawit. Iput was the mother of the next king, Pepi I. There's a lot of confusion, though, with regard to what happened between Teti and Pepi's reigns. According to Minito, Teti was murdered, though there's no archaeological evidence to corroborate this. To add to the mystery, the Abydos king list and a few other records mention a ruler named Userkare. The problem with Userkare is that he's not listed in any contemporary records, and so many scholars believe that he may have been a usurper, and, if Minito's story is true, perhaps a conspirator who may have been involved in the assassination of Teti. His relation to Teti, if there even was one, is also not known, and he may have ruled for a year or even less until Teti's true heir, Pepi I, ascended the throne. Unlike the mysterious Userkare, Pepi I had a long and prosperous reign. Given his rather long reign, Pepi I probably became king at a young age. The king list known as the Turin Canon states that he reigned for 20 years, but contemporary records, as well as other evidence from the 6th dynasty, indicate that it was closer to 50 years, which is now generally accepted by most Egyptologists. Pepi I is known to have had at least five wives. 
One of them, named Weret Intes, was part of a conspiracy against the king, though this was ultimately thwarted and the wife punished. Two of his other wives had the same name, Ankh Nesmer Ire, and were both daughters from the same prince of Abydos named Kui, though whether or not they had the same mother isn't known. As for the state, the governors, or nomarchs of the various administrative districts, increasingly became more independent of the government in the capital city of Memphis. Though not powerful enough to openly challenge the king, many of them used their positions to greatly enrich themselves. This resulted in larger mansions, estates, and lavish mastabas for themselves, but less tax revenue for the royal treasury. There was little, though, that Pepi could do, with the exception of bestowing great titles to the heads of noble families in an effort to keep them happy and not totally cut ties with his government. Basically, the king had become more of a figurehead, with the real power in the hands of ambitious nomarchs outside of the capital. In an effort to keep himself relevant, Pepi tried to reassert his presence in the provinces by commissioning temples and chapels dedicated to himself. These so-called Ka temples were meant to remind the people, as well as the nomarchs and other high government officials, who was really at the top of Egypt's social hierarchy. Despite his power weakening, Pepi's reign was still politically stable and he was able to finance many trading expeditions to all of the surrounding countries, including Nubia in the south, the land of Punt to the east, and Canaan to the northeast. Of course, there wasn't always peace, and along with commercial expeditions, there were several military campaigns in many of the areas just mentioned. Insight into what such campaigns were like comes from one of the most important finds of the 6th dynasty, and that's an inscription known as the Autobiography of Weni. Weni was an extraordinary individual who lived during the reigns of the 6th dynasty's first three kings, Teti, Pepi I, and Merenre. His autobiography gives us a glimpse into his life and how he rose from the humble position of storehouse custodian to become head of the palace guard, a high court judge, and eventually a close confidant of Pepi I. It's a pretty extraordinary biography for a truly remarkable individual and demonstrates the power and influence that even one born a commoner could obtain during the reign of Egypt's sixth dynasty kings. But back to Pepi. As mentioned earlier, he ruled for almost 50 years, eventually passing away around 2280 BC. He was succeeded by his son, Merenre. Unlike his father, Merenre's reign was quite short, with evidence indicating that it was no more than five to six years. During that time, Merenre, through one of his officials, Herkueth, sent numerous trading expeditions deeper into Nubia and the land of Yam, which scholars believe today might be somewhere in northern Sudan. This area was a transit point for precious woods and ivory from sub-Saharan Africa into Egypt. When Yam was attacked by its enemies, Herkueth and his soldiers from Egypt fought alongside it, for which they were handsomely rewarded. The campaign there further strengthened Egypt's ties with Nubia, and Merenre is said to have traveled to Upper Egypt, where representatives from many of Nubia's great tribes came to meet him. Other than this, Merenre continued the policies of his father and predecessors until his death, which many Egyptologists now believe was in 2278 BC. He was succeeded by his much younger brother, who became Pepi II. Pepi II is famous in Egyptian history for a few things. One is his incredibly long reign, which various texts seem to state was 94 years. If he became king at age 6, as texts indicate, then he would have lived to have been around 100 years old. However, many Egyptologists are convinced that this was not the case, and that it might be closer to 64 years because the number 94 and 64 look very similar in the cursive script that scribes used, and so there might have been some confusion or an error as royal chronicles were recopied and transmitted in later centuries. Whether 64 or 94 years 
it's clear that Pepi II reigned for a very long time. Along with the length of his reign, Pepi II also had many wives, a few of whom were actually his close relatives. For example, his principal wife was a lady named Neith, who just happened to be his half-sister and cousin. Another wife was Ipwet, the daughter of his brother, Merenre. Along with these two, Pepi II also had other wives. Such close marriages raise a few questions about the state of the monarchy at the time. Royal marriages were generally political alliances meant to foster stronger ties with other powerful and influential families. The fact that at least two of Pepi II's wives were close kin might mean that the royal family had become more politically isolated, or perhaps chose to be so, all at a time when ambitious men in the provinces were becoming the real power brokers of the country, as can clearly be seen by the opulence and splendor that many of these nomarchs were living in. Many of them also had this constant obsession with bestowing upon themselves more lofty titles than they probably deserved. For example, one local magistrate, Pepianc of Mir, stated on his tomb walls that he was not just some ordinary government official, but also a counselor, the keeper of the city of Nekin, chief justice and vizier, chief scribe of the royal tablet, scribe of the royal tablet of the court, royal seal bearer, god seal bearer, attendant of the apis bull, spokesman of every resident of Pe, overseer of the two granaries, overseer of the two purification rooms, overseer of the storehouse, senior administrator, lector priest, overseer of Upper Egypt in the Middle Gnomes, royal chamberlain, pillar of Kenmut, priest of Mat, privy to the secret of every royal command, and finally, favorite of the king in every place of his. Which, honestly, I don't really know what that means. That's a lot of titles, but it's unlikely that Pepe Yank actually performed the duties that came with each one. Instead of focusing on matters of importance to the state, such officials seem to be more interested in collecting such titles. But back to Pepe II. Though he's recorded to have sent expeditions to Nubia and several other areas along the Red Sea, towards the end of his reign, Pepe seems to have been living in a bubble and extremely isolated from those who served the country in his name. Of course, as the king, Pepe II was ultimately responsible for the success of his kingdom, and many Egyptologists do place a good amount of blame on him for being such an incompetent ruler. But when you think about it, what more could have been expected of him? Pepi II came to the throne at the young age of six, and obviously couldn't make his own decisions. Instead, the country was overseen by a series of regents that may have also included his mother. By the time that Pepi was old enough to make his own decisions and rule the kingdom himself, he'd already lived a life of luxury in the palace, and was completely used to and reliant upon those around him to make the big decisions with regard to running the country. And so, he ended up being a rather incompetent ruler who could easily be taken advantage of by more seasoned politicians and provincial governors who knew well how the game of Egyptian politics was played. To make matters worse, during the second half of his reign, a prolonged period of drought and low crop yields caused famine throughout much of Egypt and later texts seem to indicate that Pepi's government was unable to coordinate a countrywide effort to alleviate the situation. It's not surprising, then, that Pepi II was remembered by later generations as being lazy and highly inept. Add to all this the problem of securing a successor. Towards the end of his reign, Pepi was so old that he outlived many of his heirs, making it hard to find a successor who not only had the skills to rule, but also the widespread, if not token support, of the powerful families of nobles and nomarchs throughout the kingdom. When the frail old Pepi died in 2184 BC, one of his sons succeeded him as Merenre II, but it's not for certain whether or not he was even recognized as king of the entire country. His reign was short, and afterward, a woman who many believe may have been his wife Queen Nekukerti possibly became the new ruler. 
Nicokerti's gender has not been confirmed, but according to Manitho, who calls her Necrotis, she was braver than all the men of her time, the most beautiful of all the women, fair-skinned with red cheeks. Manitho's story, though, doesn't make sense, because the name Nicokerti is actually that of a man, and there's no archaeological evidence to confirm both Manitho's story or if this individual was even a woman. What is clear is that the centralized authority of the monarchy had all but broken down, and Egypt was now on the road to civil war. It also brought an end to the period of Egyptian history that we call the Old Kingdom. More on that in the next installment of Ancient Egypt, Dynasty by Dynasty. Stay tuned. As always, thanks so much for stopping by, I really appreciate it. I'd also really like to thank Grandkick69, Yap de Graf, Pasta Frola, Michael Lewis, Daniel Allen, Danny Van Eck, Wenix TV, Robert Morgan, Frank, Tim Lane, Sebastian Hurtado Correa, Michael Trudell, Franz Robbins, Brendan Redman, Faridun Dadachanji, Jimmy Daruwala, Sher Cam, Farhad Kama, and all of the channel's patrons on Patreon for helping to support this and all future content. Check out the benefits to being a Patreon member, and if you'd like to join, feel free to click the link in the video description. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as continue to listen to special audio programs on the History with Sai podcast. Thanks again, and stay safe. <laughs>